Thank you, Father Kevin. Father Kevin uh, pointed out that uh, this is the end of a, a series of lectures, which it seems to me has been very well attended, and we therefore begin with a thank you for all of you of the public who took the time out to come and have come today. A friend of mine said, very bad timing. Everybody will be doing their Christmas shopping on a Saturday in December. <laughs> You've proven a friend wrong. Uh, Father Kevin also pointed out the, the fact that it's a series that has included Carmelite saints from the 16th century, uh, whereas Edith Stein is herself someone who is very close in time to us. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> can you still hear okay? Uh, uh, and I, I just did a little bit of quick arithmetic. I've done this before. I just don't have it memorized. But uh, to show you how th this particular person I'm going to be speaking about uh, hits chords that certainly some of us would, would be connected to, regardless of whether we're rooting for Edith Stein or rooting for the Carmelites, she is so close in time to us that I can call myself a contemporary of Edith Stein for a full 74 days. <laughs> Mama brought me into the world on the 27th of May, 1942. She died on the 9th of August, 1942. So therefore, I really, I, I come, this doesn't give me any kind of certificate or, or certification, but just a certain feeling of empathy towards the person. Uh, we're going to speak to her, uh, speak about her today from a different angle, <clears throat> as has been the purpose of this whole lecture series. To talk about these Carmelites as people who have left behind traces written, so they are authors. Uh, but I'd like to put as a subtitle to my presentation today, Edith Stein, one of the rarest of rare women of the 20th century. According to the outline that we have adopted for these lectures, which, we will, which will actually figure in a book to help people get an introduction, I'd just like to leave you at the beginning with a keynote remark from her, which really sums up who she was. Then I'll go into who she was, a, bi a biographical sketch, who she remains, through four key concepts she leaves us as a Christian author, then some indications to you about where you can find further information about her bibliography, and finally end with a prayer. So, as I believe, she was one of the rarest of rare persons of the early 20th century, a woman philosopher with a doctoral degree in philosophy. She obtained academic standing by passing her doctoral exam in 1916, summa cum laude. Later on in that century, after publishing several books and articles in her field, she took on the task of delving into the substance of being itself. She wrote, finite and eternal being, an ascent to the meaning of being, with the following Pithy remark, so many people just love to quote, what did not lie in my plan lay in God's plan. There you have the quintessential Stein self-description. An active person capable of planning and directing life's undertakings so as to be a generous contributor to the human progress, but also a questing spirit deriving fulfillment from following God's plan and his lead that she had for a time banished from her life. Her eventual cooperation with God is why she is also known to us today as Saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, a truly significant contemporary figure who died as recently, as I said, in 1942 murdered by the Nazi persecutors of her people, Europe's Jews. She didn't actually write that poignant thought, what did not lie in my plan, lay in God's plan, to describe her own life. As part of that book, that philosophical book, Finite and Eternal Being, 
She used it to make a hypothetical statement about chance versus providence. But her whole life tended to prove both how wise the thought was and how well it fit the unfolding of her own personal destiny. Firmly convinced that, to quote, we are in this world to serve humanity, a statement that she coined in her autobiographical work, Life in a Jewish Family. You can find it on page 148 in the ICS edition. She gave credit to God's plan as transforming power for her efforts and let it lead her resolutely from her baptism that occurred in her 31st year to her 51st year when she perished in the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp. Any narrative of all that she experienced in that half century of life between 1891 and 1942 is really engrossing. And I hope the summary of it that I can share with you now will do justice to what she contributed and also to your interest in understanding her better. So who was Edith Stein, Teresa Benedicta Stein? She was born in Breslau, Prussia, at the time Prussia, uh, now Wrocław in Poland, on the 12th of October, 1891, of devout Jewish parents. That day in 1891 was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and her birth as the last of 11 children endeared her very much to her observant mother. Precocious from childhood on, she always excelled in school. As a teenager, though, she lost fervor for her faith when, as she wrote, she deliberately and consciously gave up praying to God in her 15th year. Teenage crisis, some people would say. But God no longer had an influence on what she was doing for a time. She became interested in philosophy after dissatisfaction set in over the studies that she had begun in psychology at the University of Breslau. She, she read the important philosophical treatise Logical Investigations of Edmund Husserl, the founder of phenomenology, and went then to Göttingen University to study with him. The ideas were so important and cogent, she said, I've got to go find the source. So she changed universities. During World War II, when she was in university, though, she generously interrupted her studies to serve as a volunteer nurse with the Red Cross. Before the war ended, she defended then her doctoral dissertation on the problem of empathy, which was soon published. Husserl hired her then to be his assistant at Freiburg University. There she introduced, introduced beginners to the method of phenomenology in what she called her philosophical kindergarten. Yeah. Her contacts with the Munich phenomenologist Max Scheler began her acquaintance with Christianity. Other Christian believers had an encouraging influence on her in this school of philosophers that she met in Göttingen. After several years then of spiritual searching that gradually transformed and led her toward Christ, she asked to enter the church upon reading the autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila <coughs> and was baptized on the 1st of January, 1922. She accepted then a teaching post at a girls' school run by Dominican teaching sisters in the cathedral city of Speyer. Along with her teaching duties, she acquainted herself with Catholic philosophy and translated the treatise on truth by St. Thomas Aquinas from the Latin, two volumes, and then added an extra little thing, uh, a glossary of terms, so people would be able to understand what <clears throat> both phenomenology was uh, propounding and then some uh, understanding of what the, the scholastic terminology of St. Thomas was. She traveled to several German-speaking countries to address Catholic audiences, especially on women's and educational topics. Her growing reputation led her to leave the school at Speyer 
to teach at a more specialized institution of higher learning. In 1932, she became a lecturer at the German Institute for Scientific Pedagogy in Münster and was admired as much for her intelligence as a nice little personal touch, her willingness to interact with the students in the dining room and by attending public debates with them. Uh, the professors didn't mix with the kids in those days. You, know, you were a hair doctor or a Fräulein doctor. A few that there were. There weren't that many women doctors. And so they would take their, their meals in their rooms. She went down to the cafeteria. The next year, the Nazis came to power in Germany, 1933. So she had to leave this post because of the anti-Semitic legislation that quickly was introduced by Hitler's party. She wrote a letter to Pope Pius XI in that year asking him to do all he could to stem the tide of the Nazi persecution of Jews. She was sure that the official unjust treatment, all in the name of a godless racial ideology, <clears throat> would later on lead to persecution of the church, to the harm of Germany, and of other nations. By convincing her spiritual director in that same year that the time had come, she acted on a long cherished wish and entered the Carmelite order at, this, at the city of Cologne, as Kevin said, <clears throat> taking the name of Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. After her initial training at Cologne, her superiors invited her to resume her writing. She transformed an earlier philosophical essay developed in an unsuccessful effort to obtain a university position a few years previously into her major opus, Finite and Eternal Being. In it, she attempted to synthesize the philosophy of St. Thomas with modern thought, especially with phenomenology. She also contributed spiritual essays and biographies to Catholic publications. One of them, The Prayer of the Church, drew upon her great love for liturgical prayer, nourished during the years she was a lay teacher by visits to the Beuron Archabbey of the Benedictines in southern Germany. From her monastery now as a Carmelite nun, she remained a faithful correspondent with former colleagues and friends, exercising in some cases a written form of spiritual accompaniment. Soon after the Nazi persecution of the Jews turned violent, in the nationwide Kristallnacht pogrom, it was a pogrom of the, uh, the 9th to the 10th of November in 1938, she left Germany for exile in a Dutch monastery, a daughter house in Ect of the Cologne Monastery. It occurred on the last day of that year, 1938. She showed her innate ability to adapt herself favorably to her surroundings and learned enough Dutch to serve as the portress of that monastery. Here she wrote another important book, The Science of the Cross, a presentation of the life and teaching of St. John of the Cross, and this contained a number of passages that apply the phenomenological method. We have her in Germany now in 1938. Those of you who could be either remember your, your history or your history buffs will recall that only two years later in 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands. Both Sister Teresa Benedicta and her sister Rosa, who by that time had joined her in, in Echt in Holland as a lay assistant to the monastery, had to comply with the anti-Semitic regulations. They, they, that they, what they did was they registered. Well, the registration is the thing that, that caused the next step in their life. They were rounded up on Sunday the 2nd, August 1942, and this led to deportation along with several uh, hundred other Catholic Jews uh, as a reprisal for an outspoken pastoral letter issued by the Dutch bishops condemning the anti-Semitic measures of the German occupation forces. During the week between her arrest and then her death in the concentration camp, Edith Stein acted like an angel of consolation to the prisoners. She was able to write a hurried note jotted on two calendar pages that she had been able to pray marvelously well in the midst of all the, the, the confusion and, and, and the, the terrible fear and 
and, <clears throat> and dread for concentration camps. She said, I, I've been able to play, pray marvelously well. The image that lasted in the minds of eyewitnesses who escaped the death camp, and there were a few that did get out, showed her helping many of the children who traveled under guard. Their mothers had lapsed into utter despair and lost track of the kids. So Edith combed their hair, told them stories, and looked after them as best she could. Finally, on the 9th of August, 1942, they arrived at the Auschwitz concentration camp, <clears throat> which is the uh, Auschwitz B, or Birkenau, where Edith, her sister Rosa, and their companions were gassed and then cremated. Official introduction of her cause for canonization took place in 1962, 20 years later, leading to her beatification at Cologne by Pope John the Paul II on the 1st of May, 1987. Upon her arri uh, arrival and approval, I should say, uh, declaration and approval by the Vatican of a miracle of intercession that healed an American child of a life-threatening overdose of Tylenol. That child is, was here in Massachusetts. Uh, you, might, you might have heard of her, uh, Benedicta McCarthy. Uh, the Pope canonized her at St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican on the 11th of October, 1998. In the same week, <clears throat> he recommended reading her works in his encyclical Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason. The following year, then, as was stated earlier, the Pope declared her co-patroness of Europe, the only modern era saint to be so honored. So that was her life, and a little bit afterwards what's occurred. We might ask them, well, who is she still? Can she have an influence on us? Well, <clears throat> her writings are both witnesses to what she believed, but they were also instruments of, of, of teaching. And we can benefit from that teaching, I'm sure. Regardless of whether, as Kevin evoked, uh, we're going to be, the Carmelites are going to be raising the flag and saying we have even another doctor of the church. <laughs> and by the way, a woman doctor of the church, too. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, among the three women, the Carmelites have two. Uh, and then you throw in St. John of the Cross, we have three out of the 36. Uh, some would say, you're a bit too ambitious. <laughs> uh, we'll leave that up to the people who make those decisions. What I'd like to do is tell you just a few things from her that really will convince you that she, she has something still to say for us today, for us Christians. Not only, you know, did she borrow her religious name from the great St. Teresa of Avila, she assimilated so well the lifestyle and teaching of Teresa, the first woman doctor of the church, that she shines forth as a great interpreter of Carmelite life, the Carmelite monastic life that she embraced from 1933 on. She was a woman of deep prayer, a devotee of the power of the risen, crucified Savior, a constant servant of the truth, and an empathic guide to wisdom. The spiritual and intellectual heritage that St. Edith Stein left us gravitates around those four elements of her output. So, prayer, uh, the cross, truth, and wisdom. Prayer for Edith Stein is well summed up by the following sentences that she wrote in one of her small essays entitled, Love for Love. Prayer is the communication of the soul with God. God is love, and love is goodness giving itself away. It is a fullness of being that does not want to remain enclosed in itself, but rather to share itself with others to give itself to them, and to make them happy. She conveys succinctly what prayer was in the vision of St. Teresa, namely an exercise of love before all else. Not a search for transformed states of consciousness, nor simply deeper understanding of doctrine, but a personal encounter in love with the living God. That 
friendly encounter with the one we know loves us. To quote from St. Teresa of Avila. I think there's another important element in her vision of prayer as I just read it to you. You want me to try it again? Yeah. It is the communication of the soul with God. God is love and love is goodness giving itself away. It is a fullness of being that does not want to remain enclosed in itself but rather to share itself with others, to give itself to them and to make them happy. What's going on is here, she's borrowing from Pseudo Dionysius, the 6th century Christian thinker, and it is this, the ecstatic side to prayer. But taking the word ecstatic eh, very close to its Greek root, ecstasy, step out of. Not ecstasy, again, as a promise of transformed states of mind, but the activity of repaying love for the love given by God. One is transformed into the image of God who gives and thus goes out of him or herself, if you prefer to say God, she, uh, with ecstasy, meaning that literally, going out. For prayer to be authentic in its very core, it must lead us beyond a simple vis-a-vis and reach outward to others, just as God has reached out and touches us individually. Being that does not want to remain enclosed in itself as she puts it so succinctly. She thus rejoins her seraphic mother, St. Teresa of Avila, who could call for works, 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 in the most interior reaches of the interior castle from those who had advanced considerably along the way of perfection. The cross. The so-called subtitle for St. Edith was of the cross. Carmelites, when they join the order, take a little ditty at the end of their name. You know, it's a subtitle, we call it. If you want, if you admit a little bit of a digression <clears throat> away from Central Europe into the, the green fields of Ireland. Uh, uh, my, uh, as a young boy growing up in Brooklyn, my grandmother was upstairs in the apartment above us and because the, my grandparents were retired, they had a little, few more pennies and all that, so she'd invite me up for a glass of chocolate milk. And that sometimes happens, you know, especially little boys, distracted or whatever it was, I'd spill it. And so Nanny, Nanny Fox would say, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, Johnny, will you stop spilling your milk? Okay. <laughs> well, would you believe it? When I became a Carmelite, uh, I, I, I had a different name. Uh, it's Ireland again. Uh, we had to change our names before a certain point in time. <clears throat> I reverted back to John because my mother always called me Johnny anyway, and it, was, it didn't matter if I was going to be called Brother Mel. That was my name, Brother Mel. But my subtitle was of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. <laughs> uh, the whole story there. We'll, we'll spare you the story of how it happened. But see, when she became a Carmelite, she asked to have the name... Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. And it's striking how many other major Carmelite figures pay such tribute to the cross in the way that they were designated. John of the Cross, Therese of the Child Jesus and of the Holy Face. The Holy Face is the suffering face of Christ in the Passion. And then Mary of Jesus Crucified and others. They trusted implicitly in the old Latin dictum ad lucem per crucem, or to light via the cross. So St. Edith assures us the followers of the crucified are enfolded with the light of heaven. They therefore benefit richly from their devotion for the instrument of their salvation, the cross. The saint never doubted the beneficial effects of the cross on her, nor on anyone who rejoices in its power to save. Her name and religion proclaim this truth through that subtitle. And we are told by her in a letter that she directly asked for it. It wasn't just imposed upon her. Frequently the Carmelite uh, nuns would have it revealed to them what the name would be. She requested it. Uh, But only what you have to realize is that very, very refined woman that she was. 
and so well trained in the classical tradition, she was aware of the fact that the name that she asked for was a play on words. Teresa Benedicta a Cruce. It's, it translates easily into English as Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, but Teresa and Benedicta is the passive, per, per, passive perfect participle, as you might know from Latin. So it means blessed by, and then a cruce, the cross. So she had this little bit of a kind of a message for people that she was proclaiming by how her name itself, that she was blessed by the cross. She did a favor, I think, to us by reminding us of this. Although elsewhere, she was correct in also stating that the cross has no purpose of itself, and it is thus not an end in itself. She's not morose. She's not fatalistic, saying, well, we, you know, uh, suffer, an instrument of suffering is, is the type of thing we all are going to have a great time with. No. But she unflinchingly depended on it as a source of blessings. Aware as she was of the theology of the Paschal mystery, stressed by the liturgical movement of her time, she confidently relied on the cross to transform her life positively. She was and could be blessed because she expected the resurrection and the glory of the risen Lord after paying the price of discipleship that the cross would exact. Luckily for her, she was a Catholic laywoman, active at a time when the liturgical movement in Germany was stressing devotion from Christ away from a suffering-centered Good Friday before all else vision to the fuller Paschal mystery that stressed the vindication which Easter gave to his self-sacrifice. For Sister Teresa Benedicta, the ascent up Mount Carmel led through struggle and effort to the haven of peace that was life with Christ at the summit where only the honor and glory of God dwells. My third point is that she was always a constant servant of the truth. Edith had acute skills of observation. Her talent for analysis enabled her to strive uh, to delve easily into the human side of things and prove herself sympathetic toward persons confused over life's mysteries. She knew that finding the truth is a lifelong effort requiring steadfast and dogged perseverance. Having undergone a period bereft of God's direction, this is her so-called atheistic phase, from 15 through 30 years of age, she could appreciate how people can sometimes wander. As a result, she showed kindness towards searchers after the truth. She offered some droll spiritual advice for them as well when she once said, have patience with yourself, God has it too. Pope John Paul II esteemed her for the God-given gift that she shared with others, and he commented on her love for the truth during his beatification homily about another passage that came from her. He quotes her this way. <clears throat> she said, My search for the truth was a constant prayer. This is a comforting bit of testimony for those who have a hard time believing in God. The search for truth is itself, in a very profound sense, a search for God. Those are the words of John Paul II, philosopher, pope, a man who is truly, you know, Catholic. And some might say, if they were read the wrong way, somebody would say they bring him up on charges for that. You mean, because a certain <clears throat> attitude in the past would say that if you, if you don't believe you have the truth, you have to admit that you're not being fully nourished by, by you know, your Catholicism. But the man who runs Catholicism said that. <laughs> well, ran it, was running it. <laughs> you know, John Paul the Great. See, uh, he, 
she gives consolation to those who are searching for it, who don't claim they have it, 150%. Okay? Blaise Pascal can help us uh, parse the enigmatic side of this reality with his observation, which you might have heard before. You would not be searching for me unless you had already found me. The problem then to the pursuit lies not within the root experience of the divinity, but in our own limited perception of our encounter with God. Uh, Considerable surprise greeted the uh, publication a couple of years ago of a book of texts of Blessed Teresa of Calcutta. I don't know if you remember when it came out. It showed her among you know many of her her, her nice the nice parts of her life, but it, it had this troubling passage or two that people were all astir over. It showed her undergoing great affliction over a state of apparent non-contact with God. The Lord, as in the Gospels, was asleep in the boat, but there he was, right in the vessel and unmistakably present. She wasn't feeling it. This type of present, absent experience led Edith Stein to share elsewhere this cogent piece of advice, and I quote, all those who seek after truth seek after God, whether they know it or not. All those who seek after truth seek after God, whether they know it or not. Her statement carries all the more weight for its having been applied to the case of the eminent philosopher and hence indefatigable seeker after the truth, Edmund Husserl. She wrote to a colleague in in the letter that housed the other thought that I have no fear for my dear master Husserl who was lying on his deathbed at at that moment God is truth, and all those who seek after truth seek God, whether they know it or not. There's no annexionist, wishful thinking of a triumphalistic bent that was aspiring to brush aside free will in those words. You know, like Edith Stein would say, those people are stupid. They don't realize that they're seeking God whether they know it or not. She wasn't trying to do that to more or less take them you know, save them from themselves. She just said, it's the truth of the situation. It was simply an assertion that God reaches through our reticence and the native darkness of our intellectual, emotional makeup to bridge the gap and fill us with God's salvific presence. Edith Stein's comment was so much more cogent since, since she herself had come along that route. She had sought the truth and rediscovered God. She, like her beloved mentor in Catholic spirituality, St. John of the Cross, had walked the path of the dark night, but a night instilling love and ultimate light. So now we can see how I believe she was also an empathic guide to wisdom. Father Kevin and I have set you up. We wrote this out before I knew what he was going to say. Carmel now has three doctors of the church. First declared so was St. John of the Cross. Then came Teresa of Avila by the groundbreaking decision of uh, Paul VI in 1970 to make two women doctors of the church. And finally, Therese of the Jure in 1997 by an act of John Paul II in the centenary year of her death. Their presence in the ranks of church-wide teachers assures us there are lessons to be learned from spiritual, mystical experience. Doctors of the church, with the intervention of the recent popes, need no longer be schooled themselves. But they are noted with this distinction because they have shown useful fruits of wisdom in the teachings that they've left us. Teresa of Avila, I mean, she made a lot about uh, Latin, but she didn't know Latin. She never taught, never, never, you know, learned it. St. Therese, the same thing. 
So they, you don't have to be technically a theologian now to be a doctor of the church. Now, whether or not Edith Stein will one day be ranked among the doctors, we are certain that the 26 volumes of writings in the New German Scholarly edition of her works contain numerous insights into truth. And the only truth that... Oh, excuse me, I, I, I jumped ahead. Uh, uh, no, they... they no, the, the, rather, these works are full of wisdom. She applied gifts of analysis, I told you earlier on, synthesis, and a canny ability to communicate a perception of true Christian wisdom that is personalized because experiential truth. That's what wisdom is. <clears throat> wisdom with experience. Uh, wisdom is truth with experience, put it that way. This stemmed in part, I think, from the concluding moment of her conversion experience one summer night in, 1940, in 1921 when she completed her reading of St. Teresa's autobiography. Because Edith had just discovered in the final chapter Teresa describing a rapture showing the truth, she supposedly exclaimed, this is the truth, meaning it was a rapture with a vision of Christ as truth. No mere intellectual satisfaction induced those now famous words, this is the truth, but rather her conviction stemming from a sapiential knowledge based on contact with a living God. This kind of truth is real truth and the only truth that can satisfy a longing for truth like the one that had led her her whole life long. She could lay claim then to the status of a pedagogue, not a mere instructor because she taught others lessons suited to changing their lives, not merely designed to increase their accumulated reserves of knowledge. Her aim was to apply often one format that she adopted while serving as Husserl's assistant, which I mentioned earlier on. Seeing the difficulties the university students had in grasping the fundamental concepts of his new philosophical trend of phenomenology, she gave supplementary introductory lessons. In spite of the deep intellectual content being treated, she called her group her philosophical kindergarten. Underlying the humor of that expression lay the ever-present mission she assigned herself, that of guiding people forward in their lives by sharing her own wisdom with them. She was a doctor in philosophy with the distinction summa cum laude. Perhaps one day she will be granted that other highest or summa praise in the church and be declared one of its doctors. Greater familiarity with her writings will certainly enrich anyone devoting some time to them. So now I'd just like to give some ideas to you about what writings she did leave behind so you can perhaps pursue further your interest in her. I'd like to just divide my advice for brevity's sake into two, two categories. Uh, the writings that she herself has left behind, uh, available to you in English, of course, now. I mean, uh, perhaps some of you do know German. Uh, I could speak with you later on after we're done uh, where to find the German editions, but I'm talking about what's available in English. And then some basic texts that covering different phases of her rich heritage. So I'll read out to you <clears throat> the, the books that are available. First of all, the collected works of Edith Stein made available through ICS publications. Life in a Jewish Family, Essays on Woman, On the Problem of Empathy, her doctoral dissertation, The Hidden Life, Self-Portrait in Letters, Knowledge and Faith, Philosophy of Psychology and the Humanities, The Science of the Cross, Finite and Eternal Being, An Investigation Concerning the State, and Potency and Act. There are a couple of selected writings, uh, anthologies out. One, uh, Kevin touted, I, I, which I put together for Orbis Books, Marinol, it's her spiritual writings, not necessarily philosophical. 
there's room for, that we have a father with us who uh, has done a doctorate in, in Ireland on Edith Stein and Rabbi Heschel. He'd be the man to do us a, an anthology of her philosophical writings. <laughs> okay. uh, the book for Mary Knoll is in the series of modern spiritual masters, of spirituality. And then there was a, a, a book of selected writings by her niece, Susan Batsdorf, done in 1990. There are several works out about her. Susan Batsdorf, her niece, also wrote a book after the canonization called Aunt Edith, The Jewish Heritage of a Catholic Saint, in which she very usefully corrects some of the legendary things that are attributed both to the family and to Edith Stein by overzealous, perhaps, on occasion, people who didn't always look up their uh, historical sources as well as they could. And she gives a very, very good depiction of the early life of Teresa Benedicta Edith Stein before she entered the Carmelites. And then she also gives her own uh, feeling about what it means as a, a very devout Jewish woman she leads prayer services in her synagogue in Santa Rosa, California uh, uh, during the week, during the week, the, some of the prayer services. Uh, what it means to say, my aunt, the saint. <laughs> 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 you know? uh, uh, that, that, it, it does raise some questions, and she addresses them in, in her book, Aunt Edith, the Jewish Heritage of a Catholic Saint. Then... Uh, there's a, a very handy, small, smaller sized uh, summary of the life and also the philosophy of Edith Stein by Sarah Borden. Uh, it's uh, New York, London, 2003, uh, Continuum Books, a book of Christian writers, I think it's called. And then a more technical one, and very expensive because it, it's a, uh, produced by Kluwer Academic Publishers in the Netherlands. Uh, by Sister Mary Catherine Basehart, now deceased, unfortunately, a great, great philosopher herself. Person in the World, Introduction to the Philosophy of Edith Stein. And then, uh, there's, no, there's no sense <clears throat> in letting you go without putting in some kind of a plug for uh, ICS publications. There's a book that has been put together by, and I laid the groundwork for it by just praising, I think I praised, uh, her niece, Susan Batsdorf, uh, in an exercise of interreligious collaboration, um, I convinced her, the niece of Edith Stein, and a Carmelite nun who lived for a time in some of the monasteries that Edith Stein lived in, the one in, in, in Holland at least, and uh, is a, a bilingual uh, daughter of Switzerland living in the United States too, to team up. And we put together a revised edition to the very early biography of St. Edith Stein by her prioress, Sister Teresa Renata Posselt. It used to be the only book out on Edith Stein biography for the longest time after her death. It was translated into English in the 1950s. What we did is, after the year 2000, collect all the research that had been coming out in between time uh, uh, recast some of the poor translations. I must say that uh, you just do that. Scholars do that to other scholars, I guess, uh, sometimes. Uh, the, the, some of the, 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 the translation work wasn't so good in the original English. I won't mention the names of the translators so as to be a little bit polite. Uh, but what we did was we reworked that and put in something like 432 footnotes, <laughs> which weren't in the original book either, bringing people up to date on what we knew about Edith Stein much later on than when the book was originally written. But with respect for the book, because it was done by someone who lived with Edith Stein, she was her novice mistress at first when she first joined the Carmel, and then also her prioress, and so could talk from what she knew. So the book itself deserves to be there in English, but with an updating that makes it a little bit richer than what was originally put out. So this, I think, in English is the most up-to-date biography you can find on the life of Edith Stein from beginning to end, all right? With a couple of extra, extra things in here, uh, the, uh, the letter to the Pope, 
1931. See, that wasn't made available from the Vatican archives until later on, so Sister Passel couldn't have put it in her book. That's in there. It makes it almost, as they like to say, worth the price of the book itself. Uh, <laughs> so, and, anyway, okay. So, <clears throat> so much for that. I'd like to conclude, as you, you heard me say, put prayer as number one and I think the heritage of Edith Stein, how she's present to us today in a good fashion. Take something from her writings, which really serves as a prayer. And it wasn't really written quite as a prayer, as, a, as rather a little reflection. Uh, taken from her own experience as being a very, very busy teacher, uh, actively engaged in, in helping her, her students forward as a pedagogue, uh, empathic towards them, all their, their problems and worries. And, and, and you get a picture of her telling us all that we do try to help others. Sometimes it doesn't always work out. And sometimes it looks like it's a mess. But listen to what she says about what you do with the mess. The Lord is indeed there and, we, and can give us in a single moment what we need. Thus, the remainder of the day will continue perhaps in great fatigue and laboriousness, but in peace. And when night comes and retrospect shows that everything was patchwork and much which one had planned left undone, when so many things rouse shame and regret, then take all as it is, lay it in God's hands and offer it up to God. In this way, we will be able to rest in God, actually rest, and begin the new day like a new life. Okay, thank you.